Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. You know, when Wild Kingdom aired in the 1960s and 70s, many of the episodes documented wildlife research efforts. Marlon and Jim accompanied scientists all over the world to observe animals and their natural behaviors. Some of the techniques you'll see in tonight's episodes are no longer necessary by today's standards, but the work is still just as important. Wild Kingdom took viewers to the far corners of the world and cultivated an appreciation for animals and their habitats. Marlon and Jim showed us the importance of preserving the natural world, not just for animals, but for our very own quality of life. And that's good news for all of us in the Wild Kingdom. So sit back and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by the company with coverage for everyone. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. The desert is a harsh area of extremes in heat and temperature, and you wouldn't expect to find animals there. But you do, and in surprising numbers. That's because even in the desert, there's some moisture, and where there's moisture, you'll find plants. And where there are plants, there are animals, always in a constant struggle for survival against the elements and against their enemies. In order to study this survival in the sun, Jim Fowler and I went to the Sonora Desert in the great American Southwest. We made our headquarters at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum near Tucson, in the heart of the great saguaro cactus country. After director Bill Wooden had shown us this fascinating museum, we were eager to observe the desert animals in their natural habitat. Traveling through this area is like traveling through another world a ruggedly beautiful land of cactus and other plants with strange-sounding names. Mesquite, Palo Verde, Ocotilla, all dominated by the majestic giant saguaro cactus. Here, conditions for life are harsh. The rainfall measures under 10 inches of rain per year, so the only plants that can survive are those that have developed special means for storing and conserving water. Looking out over this desert, we realize that life is harsh for the animals as well. There is competition for food and danger everywhere. Sometimes it comes in the form of the thorns of the cactus. Sometimes in the form of the deadly rattlesnake. But some animals will challenge the rattlesnake. The badger is stubborn and aggressive, relying on his strong jaws and his heavy fur for protection. The snake's reaction is instinctive, but the strikes are glancing ones and don't penetrate the heavy fur. In this case, the badger is lucky, and both decide to call it quits. For the tortoise, there is little danger. Almost unique in the wild kingdom, the tortoise lives his life apart from other animals, and in his armored shell, he is virtually immune from attack. To him, the badger is little more than a nuisance. Much more of a problem is the rocky terrain, which for him amounts to an obstacle course. The shell of the tortoise not only protects him from his enemies, but insulates his body from the sun and conserves his water, which he gets from the juices of his main food, the cactus. But in some ways, life in the desert can be hazardous for the tortoise. A cliff to him can be more of a threat than a rattlesnake to a badger.
The gray fox is a common predator who, unlike the badger, approaches the rattlesnake with caution. When the fox is hungry, he eats whatever he can find, even though it happens to be a fierce, poisonous desert scorpion. When other meat is not available, the fox will even eat a spider as unappetizing as a tarantula, whose hairy body and poisonous bite protect it from most animals. Tortoise is not entirely safe from an animal as intelligent as the gray fox. Unlike the badger, he uses quick movement and long teeth in his attempt to penetrate the tortoise's defense, and is almost successful. But in this land where food is scarce, even the rattlesnake is in danger of being eaten. His enemy is the roadrunner. A bird equipped with long legs for moving fast on the ground and a large, powerful beak for a weapon. Despite the fact that the rattler's bite would be fatal, he swiftly stabs at the neck to kill or stun the snake. When this fails, he uses the amazing technique of spreading and flashing his wings as a decoy goading the rattler into striking and thereby exposing itself to attack. Finally, he finds the vital spot. Seizing the snake by the tail, the bird whips it about, testing it for any sign of life. By eating the snake head first and coiling it in his stomach as it goes down, a roadrunner can swallow a snake three feet long. Surprising as it may seem, the snake's venom, which would be fatal in a bite, has no ill effect when swallowed as food. It seems that everything in the desert is designed for survival, especially the many species of cactus each with its own shield of thorns arranged in a variety of patterns. The barrel cactus. The prickly pear. The buckhorn. The choya. This one drops its spiny thorns on the ground and the little pack rat uses them to build a home where he's protected from most of his enemies. In the giant saguaro, the elf owl uses an abandoned woodpecker hole as his home. This tiny owl, which is the smallest owl in the world, offers no real danger to the pack rat. There are some desert dwellers, however, that will invade his thorny home, the tarantula. The tarantula is not the real danger, however. The real danger to the pack rat and its neighbor, the kangaroo rat, is the rattlesnake. When it comes to dodging rattlesnakes, life can be pretty dangerous for a kangaroo rat. Of course, he has those long hind legs to help him escape his enemies, and he's adapted in other ways for desert living. He can get along entirely without water. Of course, he gets some of the water he needs from the plants he eats, but he can also convert the carbohydrates of the dry seeds he eats into water, and therefore he never really has to drink water. Jim, animals have many ways of surviving in the desert. They certainly do, Marlin.
The desert is hot, with temperatures sometimes reaching as high as 120 degrees, and the animals usually are not in evidence. To see them in their natural habitat, it is necessary to explore the desert carefully. The best way is to walk. Our first discovery was a sidewinder rattlesnake. There are several types of rattlesnakes in this area, and this fellow is very unusual because he has a special way of moving across the sand. Watch him closely now and you'll see why he's called the sidewinder. Instead of crawling straight, he travels sideways, which propels him across the sand at a much faster rate. He also has a very unusual head, and to get a closer look, we were extremely careful because his poison can kill a man. Many herpetologists feel that these protrusions above the eyes are shields against the intense desert sun. In some ways, the sidewinder is similar to other rattlesnakes. Its rattles are the same and used as a warning device. However, it is one of the small rattlesnakes and seldom reaches more than 28 inches in length. Back to the shade of a bush he goes, leaving his easily recognizable tracks. Perhaps because the reptiles are more restricted in their movements, they have become more specialized for desert living. A little farther on, we spotted another good example of this, a colony of fringe-footed lizards who have a unique way of escaping their enemies. When I tried to catch one, they suddenly disappeared into the sand, literally swimming their way to safety. Rain comes rarely to the desert, but when it does, the water holes fill and the animals come out of hiding. As we walked down a draw, we came upon a skunk clenching his thirst at one of the newly filled water holes. With their well-known protection, skunks manage to survive here in the desert about as well as they do everywhere. So we decided to give him a wide berth. As he moved away, we moved over behind some rocks to see if other animals might come to drink that day. Soon after we moved, a gray fox appeared farther down the draw. Since he's not especially adapted for desert living and has no way of storing or conserving water, the fox is one of the first animals to come to the water hole. Next to appear was a mule deer, who must still rely on the water hole even though he gets some moisture from the plants he eats. This is a young mule deer, and with those ears, he's well named. Although he's the common deer of the desert, this seems to be the first time he's ever met a young fox. Watch the uncertainty and caution with which they measure each other. After the fox and the deer had gone their separate ways, the wiliest predator of all, the bobcat, came to drink. Another skunk, confident with his special protection, came to the water hole without fear of the bobcat. The skunk served notice that he wanted to be left alone, and the bobcat had no desire to argue with him.
Today the bobcat was hungry, and the chipmunk seemed to be easy prey. looked as though all the activity was finished, so we left the water hole and worked our way to the top of the draw. Jim decided to follow the bobcat. I hadn't gone far when I saw the young mule deer browsing on a Palo Verde tree. The bobcat spied the deer at the same time, and from that moment on, I witnessed a characteristic episode in the story of life in the desert. The drama of the hunter and the hunted. Of all the animals in the desert, the one animal that is most successful in surviving attacks by his enemies is the desert tortoise. Good protection for him is his hard shell. Good protection for you is health insurance from Mutual of Omaha. On the last day of our trip, we were to join Rick Dyson of the museum staff to observe one more desert animal we had wanted to see in its natural habitat. We met Rick at the top of a dry wash where he'd already spotted our quarry, the peccary, the only true wild pig found in the United States. There was a family group here, and so we knew they would be more dangerous to approach. Under any circumstances, a peccary is a tough, vicious fighter. The young peccaries roam with the herd soon after they're born. Rick pointed out that we weren't the only observers here. A bobcat had been following the herd for some time. But the baby stayed close to mother. Rather than take on the adults, the bobcat moved away. We waited until the family group had moved on. Then when two adults appeared alone, we decided to get on with the job we'd come to do. The habits of the peccaries are not well known. So the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum is undertaking a banding project to gain more knowledge of their habits. We were out there to catch one of these tough fellows. 
tag him with an easily recognizable tag and release him. In that way, his movements could be observed and reported. Peccaries are hard to trap because they're intelligent and cautious. So we were going to try to get our peccary with that familiar weapon, the capture gun. This gun fires a special drug into the animal and puts it to sleep. When a young male came out, Rick aimed for his rump, but the dart glanced off. The peccary was frightened, but we figured he wouldn't go far. Getting within range of a peccary is not easy. To ensure accuracy, it's best to get within 20 yards of your target if you can. Then you know the dart will give a good injection in the right place. That was a hit. By his faltering gait, we could tell it wouldn't be long before the drug would take effect. The drug's a harmless one that affects the animal's nervous system. It takes effect in only a few minutes, and when it wears off, it leaves the animal with no ill effects. We tested to see if he were completely under. We knew that even when semi-conscious, he may instinctively snap at you, and he's got some of the sharpest, most dangerous teeth of any animal. Now he was completely under the influence of the drug. Jim and Rick positioned the peccary for tagging. Even though it looked like a good injection, it's hard to tell just how much of the drug was absorbed into his bloodstream. It was therefore difficult to predict how long the peccary would be knocked out. So it was necessary to record his measurements and tag him as quickly as possible. This harness and tag is large enough so that when he is sighted, he can be reported by number. Thus his movements and that of the herd can be traced over a period of time. Tag is made of brightly colored plastic so that it can be spotted from a great distance. It is held with a special clip which fastens the rope over the peccary's back. After tagging the pig, we recorded more of his measurements for later use. Here's what makes this fellow so dangerous, these great upper and lower incisor teeth. Almost as quickly as it took effect, the drug started to wear off. Peccaries have diminished at alarming rates in the last few years, and it will be as a result of tagging programs like this that the problem will be solved. Before leaving, we tested the pig to make certain the drug had worn off and to see that he was all right. And he was. This peccary will be observed and possibly captured again to add to our knowledge of his life in the desert. If so, the capture gun will again remove the hazards involved in handling a dangerous animal. As you travel through this vast, dry area known as the Sonora Desert, you can't help but wonder, once again, why there is so much animal life in an area that, to us, seems to be a difficult place for animals to live. Perhaps the answer lies in the words, to us. For I'm sure that to the animals, these seemingly difficult circumstances are quite natural. They've adapted to the dry, sunny region and have learned to survive on the cactus and other plant life which in turn has adapted itself to the meager water supply that comes from the occasional rains. If there were no water, there would be no plant life, and thus no animal life. But looking at these beautiful landscapes, one realizes that given a very little water, life has tenaciously taken hold and spread and created, seemingly out of nothing, a truly magnificent wild kingdom. <laughs> The company with health insurance for people of all ages has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom.
Like what you saw? Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for more exclusive content. And visit our website at wildkingdom.com. Mutual of Omaha. Protect your kingdom.